Now we want to discuss statistical inference. Remember we're using the estimated regression equation here to approximate the regression model that applies to the entire population of the driving assignments. We're going to look at the values like t-statistics and p-values to see whether we could generalize our regression equation to the driving assignments that are not in our sample data, that is, to the entire population. But the computations that gave us these values came from making certain assumptions of our data. So we need to check those assumptions first before we use these statistics. So what are these assumptions? Recall the regression model for the population. This model assumes that the error term here has certain properties. Here are the properties. For any fixed combination of the independent variables, the x variables, the error terms must be normally distributed, have a mean of 0, and have a constant variance. In addition, the error terms must be statistically independent from one another. Well, this part is a concern only if your data are in a form of time series, like you know, weekly data, monthly data, and so forth. Now, all these assumptions are difficult to understand without looking at some pictures. So we're going to look at a picture, and we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to look at a picture for a simple regression with only one x variable. What do we got here? We got here the x-axis and then the y-axis and then the trend line here, the regression line. For instance, when x is equal to 10, then the predicted y value, you know, the y hat, is over here. Now if you look at the scatter chart, you would see dots scattered above and below the trend line. Some dots are above the trend line uh, with positive residuals, and some dots are below the trend line with negative residuals. What we're seeing here uh, is that these residuals must have normal bell curve shape. So there should be more values near the regression line and fewer values as you go far from the uh, regression line. As in bell curve shape, the higher frequency near the middle and the lower frequencies as you go far from the middle. Now the errors should have a mean of zero. That means the center of this normal distribution should be at the regression line where the residual is equal to zero. For our Butler example, we could check these conditions by looking at the residual plots given by Excel. In these residual plots, the residuals are in the vertical axis uh, and the horizontal axis has the respective x variable. Let's take a look at the, the sheet with the details. Remember the residuals here, you know, the observed value minus the predicted y value. So those are the values on that vertical axis of the residual plot. Then the horizontal axis has the miles in that first plot and deliveries in the second plot. We also have the residual plots uh, on the slide these plots are taken from your textbook. You can see here both of these residual plots uh, pretty much satisfy those three conditions about the errors. They're symmetric about the zero line. For each x value, there are a similar number of positive residuals versus a negative residuals. And more points tend to be concentrated close to the zero line over here. And the spread of the residuals are similar for the you know, different x values. These conditions do not have to be perfectly satisfied for our regression to be valid. We are fine as long as there is no strong violation of one of these conditions. Here are some examples that exhibit distinct patterns violating at least one of those conditions. The first panel here has a spread of the residuals increase as the x values increase. 
it has a funnel shape so the arrows do not have you know constant variance in the second panel the residuals are negative in the middle and um, positive for smaller x values and larger x values so the centers of the spread of the residuals are not consistently at the zero line in fact they have this kind of curve shape in the third panel the residuals are not symmetric around the zero line the negative residuals are close to the zero line and the positive residuals are far from the zero line in the fourth panel the residuals follow some sort of seasonal pattern so they are not independent from one another for example like looking at from here residuals tend to increase three times and then decrease increase three times and then decrease and so on this is typical in a time series data with seasonality like a quarterly kind of data it's also helpful to have a residual plot against the predicted y values that is these two columns scatter chart of these two columns that chart is not automatically generated by excel but it's very easy to make it ourselves. So here's a residual plot, the scatter chart with the residuals versus the, the y hat, the predicted y values. You can see that this chart has no obvious violations of the assumptions either. By the way, you don't have to create these columns yourself, predicted values and the residuals. These are given in the regression output you could see them down here. In fact, let me just quickly do a scatter chart. So there it is. Now that we know that our residuals satisfy the conditions for reliable reference, we could assess our model to see that we're using the appropriate x variables to predict the y. So the question is, does each x variable really belong in the regression for predicting the y? Does each x variable have a statistically significant relationship with the y variable? Another way of saying it is, does each x variable make a unique contribution in predicting the y variable? Well, why is this important? Well, you wouldn't want to include in our regression an x variable that is not helping us predict the y variable. I mean, if we tell the computer we want to use certain variables, like miles and deliveries, as the x variables, then it will give you a regression containing these variables, even if some of them are not really appropriate. It is up to us to decide whether to use the regression equation given to us. But fortunately, Excel will give us all these other values, like t statistics and the p values, to help us make that decision. We're going to perform hypothesis tests on the, each of these x variables to make sure they belong in the regression. So first, let's test miles. Now the question is, does knowing how many miles will help us predict how much time the driving will take? According to our estimated equation from our sample data, yes. But will this hold true for our population equation? Take a look at the regression model here. Notice the miles is the x1 variable here. Suppose we find out even though b sub 1 here is given as 0 0.0672, in the population model, beta sub 1 uh, happened to be 0. So if beta sub 1 is actually equal to 0, what will happen to this model is going to look like this. Well, since beta sub 1 is 0, this whole thing will be 0. And the x sub 1 will no longer belong in the regression model, meaning the value of x sub 1 has no effect on the value of y. So basically, what we need to do is we need to perform a hypothesis test on each of the x variables. For each x variable, we need to confirm that the corresponding beta coefficient is not equal to zero to make sure we could use the corresponding x variable. So it comes down to choosing one of the two hypotheses for each variable x sub j. 
And here the J is just a subscript uh, for these uh, X variables. So J runs from 1 through, let's say, Q for the number of X variables. So the two choices are here. The null hypothesis says uh, the corresponding beta sub j is 0, meaning there is no relationship between the y and the corresponding x variable. And the alternative hypothesis h sub a says beta sub j is not equal to 0, this meaning there is a linear relationship between y and the corresponding x variable. Now remember the uh, b sub j is the sample regression coefficient. So it is an estimate of the beta uh, sub j. So if the sample regression coefficient b sub j is close to zero, uh, then we might conclude uh, that the beta could be equal to zero. So we would choose h sub zero. If b sub j is far from zero, uh, then we could conclude that the corresponding beta sub j is not equal to zero. So we would go with the alternative hypothesis. Now what do we really mean by the regression coefficient b sub 1 or b sub 2 being close to zero? Well, if I look at the equation here, b sub 1 is 0 0.0672, that seems pretty close to 0. And now b sub 2 is 0 0.69, so that seems farther from 0 than b sub 1. But it doesn't really work that way. We can't really use the magnitude of the b sub 1 and b sub 2 to see whether they are close or far from 0 because the magnitude of the coefficient really depends on the uh, what kind of x variable you're using it depends on the units of the x variables. So what we want to do is we want to standardize these coefficients. It's similar to taking your raw data and calculating the z-scores of your data. In this case, standardizing the regression coefficients uh, give us the t-statistics. t-statistic is a measure of the distance from 0 to the b sub j. And it's calculated like this. Here is the raw distance from 0 to b sub j. We take that distance and divide by the standard deviation of b sub j. So we are standardizing the distance, kind of like when we compute the z-score by taking the original value and then subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. So it's the same kind of thing. Remember when the z-score was 3 units above or below 0, it was far enough from 0 to be considered an outlier. In a similar way, if the t-statistic is certain number of units above or below 0, and that threshold is called critical t, then the t-statistic is considered far enough from zero and we choose the alternative hypothesis that says the corresponding beta cannot be equal to zero. The threshold for the magnitude of the z-score was around three. The threshold for the magnitude of t is somewhere between 1.5 and three but is not fixed. At this point, if you go back to the Excel file for the output and look for the t statistics, they are over here for the two variables. For x1, it is about 27.37. For x2, it's about 23.37. Both have very large magnitudes, so they are very far from zero. The threshold for the t statistic that is a critical t. Critical t's value depends on a couple of things, on the sample size and the alpha value, which is a level of significance. Well, that sounds kind of complicated. So instead of worrying about comparing t statistic to the critical t, uh, we're going to use the p-value. What is p-value? p-value is the probability of obtaining a t 
whose magnitude is at least as large as the one in the output. To understand what we mean by that, let's take a look at the graph of a t-distribution over here. For example, suppose in the Butler case, our t-statistic for one of the coefficients is, let's say, 2.0. The p-value when t is 2.0 happens to be 0.046. p-value is the probability that the magnitude of t, the absolute value of t, is at least as large, greater than or equal to 2.0, the one that was obtained. That would be the sum of these two areas. Uh, here, the area is a probability that t is greater than 2.0 and on the left hand side this area is a probability that t is less than or equal to negative 2.0 which is the equivalent of this probability. So p-value is the sum of these two areas, uh, these two tails. The two areas are the same so each area is actually half of p. So the area of each tail is 0 0.023 and two of them add up to 0 0.046. Now what if the t statistic is larger? So instead of 2.0, what if it's let's say 2.5? So it's maybe somewhere over here and the negative 2.5 here. Since these t values will be farther from zero, that is going to leave smaller tails, like over here. So p-value will become smaller. So larger t means smaller p-value. So remember, if the t statistic is larger than some threshold, then we choose the alternative hypothesis, uh, which says the beta, the corresponding beta, is not equal to zero. Now, instead of comparing the t to some, some critical threshold value, we could compare the p value to a threshold value. Uh, so larger t means smaller p, so if the p value is smaller than some threshold value, then what go, we go with the alternative hypothesis. So how small is small enough? If the p value is less than or equal to an alpha value. Well, what is alpha? Alpha is a level of significance and 0.05 is a widely accepted default value for alpha. But it's possible to have a different alpha value like 0.1 or 0.01. So basically, the default for alpha is 0.05 unless you're told otherwise. With alpha equal to 0.05, we would compare the p-value to 0.05 if it's uh, less than or equal to 0.05, uh, then we choose the alternative hypothesis and say there is some relationship. That is, a regression coefficient is not zero, and there is a relationship between the y and the corresponding x value. If the p-value is larger than 0.05, uh, then we would conclude that there is no relationship. That is, the regression coefficient is equal to zero for that particular x variable. To end up with a regression equation where each x variable has a significant relationship with the y variable, uh, this is a common set of steps we take. After we run a regression, we look at the output, and for each x variable, check if the p-value is less than or equal to 0.05. If the p-value for each x variable is less than or equal to 0.05, then that's great. The regression equation is valid, it has only the significant x variables. Now if there is some x variable with p-value greater than 0.05, then this variable is not significant. So you want to take out this variable and uh, run another regression with the rest of the x variables. Now if there are more than one x variable with p-value greater than 0.05, uh, then we would discard one at a time. So discard one x variable with the highest p-value and run the regression again.
uh, and then pick another one and so forth until we end up with the equation that has only the x variables that are significant that is with a p value less than 0.05 so these are the typical steps to uh, end up with the regression equation with only the significant x variables there are other ways if you use a dedicated statistical software it will usually offer you a number of options in getting to that equation with significant variables now in practice in real life people don't always follow the rule of accepting the regression equation consisting only of significant x variables sometimes if an x variable has relatively small p-value like 0.15 or something and if you know from experience that this x variable definitely has some relationship with the y variable then it is acceptable to leave in this non-significant x variable so even though the p-value is not small enough we might choose to leave in an x variable if you know that this x variable should help uh, predict the y variable values now let's take a look at the output for a butler example so we could see we have two variables here and here are the coefficients and the t statistics are over here so you could see they are very large uh, which would make the p values very small over here so to test each x variable we need to ask is the corresponding p value less than or equal to 0.05 now we have this strange notation here for the p values uh, these are just the scientific notation so it's kind of like like the this one 3.539 so it's kind of like it's 3.539 times 10 to the negative 83 so very 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 small basically this is a way that excel expresses zero sometimes so we could format these values so they are more clear in fact maybe we could format the other values in this table too so they don't have so many decimal digits so I'm going to select all these values and maybe we will round to the four decimal digits okay that's better so we could see for both of these variables well p values are uh, zero so they are definitely less than or equal to 0.05 so check check so both of these variables are significant this means both of the x variables miles and deliveries are doing their part in helping us predict the y variable that is the uh, travel time in testing for significance of the x variables an alternative to checking the p-values is to look at the confidence intervals for the regression coefficients. A confidence interval for beta is an interval that we believe contains the value of the beta with some level of confidence. And the level of confidence is usually 95%, so therefore we might say uh, here is a 95% confidence interval for the regression coefficient. If the confidence interval for beta includes zero, that is equivalent to the p-value being greater than the alpha value. So we would conclude that beta is zero, so no relationship. If the confidence interval for beta does not include zero, that means um, p-value is less than alpha, so we would go with the alternative hypothesis and conclude that there is a relationship let's see how that works with our example here is our 95 percent confidence interval for the first coefficient now does this interval contain zero it goes from 0.0624 to 0.0720 there is no zero between these values because well these values are both positive so we would conclude that yes the x1 is significant and the same thing here for x2 the 95 confidence interval here again does not include zero since both of the limits are positive so again the same conclusion as p being less than 0.05 whether we use the p values or the confidence interval we will reach the same conclusion
as long as the significance level is consistent. So if I'm using alpha of 0.05 for the p-value, then the corresponding conference interval is 95% conference interval. Uh, if I want to use alpha of 0.01, that is compare the p-value to 0.01, then the corresponding conference interval would be 99%. So in that case, I will be using these conference intervals here.